let me just get this lined up. I mean, th things are going to be slightly disjointed because I, I, I'm unable to show from one presentation. I'm having to show probably from about like 10 or 12. Uh, so I'm going to have to sort of find my way around. So you'll have to bear with me a little bit. Uh, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about um, Ubuntu, Ubuntu design uh, and also, I guess, Ubuntu Sura design. Uh, I firstly would like to thank our sponsors, Zamarinas, which is us, uh, Syncfusion, secondly, and then obviously the big boys, Microsoft. Uh, second to that, I'd also like to thank Ben, because like, uh, Ben's just there, and like, let's face it, without Ben, like, like, n n yeah, n like none, of the, none of this would be possible, man. He's done like, such an awesome job, and he's done it for free, and he's invested so much of his time, and I, I love that man, he's wicked, and like, hopefully we'll get to do it again. Uh, right, and now on with the show. So, uh, yeah, I'm Otto, Otto Greenslade. Um, I'm now CDO of uh, Zamariners, uh, that's Chief Design Officer. Uh, previously, I'm, well, as I'm ex visual design lead of Ubuntu Desktop and then uh, mobile and tablet as well. Um, this is basically what Ubuntu looked like, like when I arrived, and like, uh, this talk I'm going to give is certainly not, I'm not going to pretend that everything is down to me. A lot of this is my baby, but there were also like, we, we had like an amazing team, like a proper little family of people who were really operating as a unit together. Um, when I started at this point, uh, I was in charge of digital, uh, my friend Marcus was in charge of print, and my friend Dom was in charge of web. Uh, and we were like the three-pronged attack who came in to basically change everything about Ubuntu. So that's what Ubuntu used to look like as, a, as the logo. That's what Ubuntu used to look like as a desktop. Like, notice the horrific areas of sort of like pukey mustard kind of like yellow across the top, yeah? Uh, and Canonical, the company that owned Ubuntu, used to look like that. Um, like, I... I don't know, like, uh, I've always had, like, a massive obsession with science fiction, you know, like, I've grown up on Blade Runner, Akira, Star Wars, all of that stuff, like, to be perfectly honest, like, I exist in the future, in my little head, I'm, like, a 21-year-old who's, like, living 25 years <laughs> in the future, so, like, before I joined Ubuntu, like, often, um, I used to work for companies, like, as, uh, like, a trend forecaster, because for some strange reason, because I live in the future, I can generally tell people kind of what they maybe should be trying to think about doing in the future. I mean, it's like a high-risk job, because uh, basically, if you make a mistake and you advise somebody incorrectly, you're like in a lot of trouble. Uh, but and we were doing it for people like Vodafone and Orange, but like, thank fuck, like I actually didn't actually ever make any mistakes. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, it would totally ruin my career, and I probably wouldn't be talking here now. Uh, so, um, yeah, when I first started at Ubuntu, like, uh, I don't know, it seemed like the most incredible opportunity to me. They were like, well, we are endeavouring to compete against like Windows and Mac, uh, but we don't want to be Windows or Mac. Like, you know, we already have like this very established personality. You know, like we're the top uh, developer distro of Linux. Um, but, you know, there's sort of some things we want to do. We, just, like, we no longer want to just be that. We want to kind of actually encompass everybody. You know, like, we want to be... We want, like, you know, 14-year-old kids to kind of be using, like, Ubuntu. We want, like, grandmothers to be a, feel Ubuntu is approachable and that they can use it too. Uh, <coughs> so we want to basically appeal yes. to everybody. What's going on there? Uh, maybe it's a backfield of finger, finger me that is... Uh, uh, which is uh, the, one of the thing of me is you've got Maybe two. it's just like my aura. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's see the battery. Uh, that, uh, the other one, this one. Can I get that and switch it off and see how it goes? Yeah, oh. that's okay. So how about we replace it with that guy? Okay. Um, it kind of was my aura, though. Uh, okay, yeah, is that... This one is worse. Oh, is okay. it? Yeah. Can, you, can, you, can you plug it on for me? <laughs> I do it badly. I'm not a beatboxer. All right. All right. You know, right it's actually ready for me to give you a slap. We are and the, the, the other cheek. Yeah, what? <laughs> Just to kind of really focus me. Uh, yeah, like, so where was I? Um, yeah, so like, I, it's like an incredible opportunity, but obviously very scary too. It's that, like I'm really echoey now. Yes, it's, All right. it's your aura. Yeah, fair enough. No, but, um, 
really? Can we just tone it down a bit? It's like, I could, now I, could, I can't hardly hear. That's way worse than the other one. Hold on, no, we're going to put it like nice in the middle like that. All right, yeah, okay, that's better. Uh, yeah, so like, we, you know, basically could do kind of whatever we wanted, really. So like, um, I was drawing on all of this stuff that I'd like been following in science fiction since I was a child. Um, and like one or two of the areas that I always sort of like has been particularly innovative with that was like um, film uh, and also games. Like so, I was quite looking quite heavily at the games industry because I always think they're one of the first p uh, places to see like UI innovation and also film because like really uh, UI in film is just uh, like a visual spectacle. You know, like you don't actually have to prove that any of it works. I mean, you think of films like, um, I don't know, like sort of stuff from Minority Report, for example, although actually MIT did, you know, totally back them up for that film. So in actual fact, like all of the stuff kind of was not, well, not proven technology, but the concepts were, could have been realized or may well be in the future. So, you know, I was looking at stuff like that. Uh, Lots of holographic stuff, lots of layered interfaces. Um, I don't know, I was kind of curious as to whether or not, like, you know, like a desktop, for starters, I, primarily I started on the desktop, like mobile tablet comes later. Uh, whether it could just be something completely different, like could it be like that? Could it be like such a fun experience? Could it be like, you know, that it was an absolute pleasure to interact with, uh, but then also not compromising the content or the applications that you would be using? Uh, I was looking at the, you know, uh, other interface, what have we got here, like a bit of Iron Man. There's like a really cool bit in Iron Man, Iron Man where they do a really nice kind of folder structure stuff. I had a piece of that. Uh, Spirits Within, like in one of the first places I saw like really, really beautiful, like full floating 3D holographic stuff. But I, was, I kept watching it again and again going like, oh my God, I'd love to use that for something. Uh, uh, I think this is stuff from Mission Impossible. Uh, you know, so basically, at, when I first started, all I was doing is like going all over the place, like gathering all of this cool stuff where I, wherever I could find it. You know, whether or not I could see any relevance to it actually being used for like a find the menu or not really didn't bother me at that point in time. Uh, I just wanted to sort of absorb as much information as humanly possible so then I could kind of like work on it and tease it out uh, and, and see. Right, a few more screens of that. Oh, what's that film where, you know, like they're basically you know, body bags, can't remember. Uh, right, move on, bit more stuff. Uh, then, like, well, I'll start showing some sort of interface stuff. So, from that, I start, like, playing around with some ideas at Ubuntu. Like, like, there's definitely this sort of, like, holographic, like, layery stuff I'm quite interested in. So, I'm kind of thinking, I don't know, almost a bit like, what are they, what were they called? There's uh, the things with the numbers in the, the, that you illuminated. Like, really, really old-fashioned computers would have them. They were almost like valves. But like there was this really, really beautiful like hexagonal grid that went through them, and like, that's sort of used to electrify planes. And like, I really like that. So sort of like layers of glass, but with like layers of electricity in between. And I kind of saw computer screens almost a little bit like that. You know, like you, you get these days they're very shiny. It's like a layer of glass, and then you've got consecutive layers of like data happening, kind of like going within, deeper and deeper. Um, started mucking around with like some sort of you know just some initial ideas, you know. At that point, even, we were like mucking around with like changing the Ubuntu logo. So that was just sort of this like little infinity like UN thing that we were playing with. Uh, yeah, it's nothing else that's that interesting on that one. Um, looking at, uh, yeah, I mean, everything was just ex exploratory at that point. So how are we going to tackle it? What kind of materials are we going to use for the top bar? I think at that point in time, like um, I was working directly with Mark Shuttleworth, like the, the owner of Canonical and Ubuntu. Um, and, you know, he was just kind of like, well, I'll tell you, just try to play around and do whatever you want. So it was kind of like, well, you know, like, is the thing around the thing going to be metal or is it going to be indented or how's it going to feel? Is it going to be soft? Is it going to be smooth? Is it going to be textural? Like, you know, we really weren't sure. But it was, I guess, an amazing opportunity to have the freedom to do that. All I have to say is that I used to have weekly check-ins with him and I used to really feel the pressure about like what I was going to deliver each week. We're going like, well, it's got to be quite badass at least, really. Otherwise, you think I haven't really done anything. Um, so then we kind of like, uh, there's a default like kind of um, a layout in Ubuntu where you can kind of test the theme where it's, you know, basically every element of the theme is displayed together. Uh, so I adopted that, copied that, like you imported that into Photoshop and set it up so that I could start playing with that, like with different materials and bits and pieces. Um, 
to be honest, at that point, like, we, I guess I'd been using uh, Mac for years and years and years, so it seemed like that that was, you know, we, I guess I was maybe being kind of influenced quite heavily by that. Uh, and actually, like, Mark, Mark really liked that. I think kind of secretly he would, you know, quite like to be the new Steve Jobs. But uh, so, you know, we were kind of like, well, that's our main competitor. Like, we probably want to be like that, but we don't want to be like that. We have our own personality, but, you know, we want to be different, but the same. Uh, <coughs> so we were doing quite a lot of that. But then I was kind of also trying to like just see like, well, what could we do that was different? You know, like uh, what things could we experiment with that was different? And like this thing like really started to appeal to me. It was like, well, at the moment, like everything that you see on a computer, it's kind of like uh, not so much led by light, but also the antithesis of that. It's um, like shadow and darkness, you know, folders are casting shadows. So it's not like about light, but more about the opposite of that. And I was like, well, what if we flip it on its head? Like, uh, how do we start to make things look glossy? How do we start to make things like reflect light and to be light? Because I think if anything, like we were feeling we were more light than we were dark, more positive than negative. So like even simple stuff like that, you know, like running this diagonal fade like through a whole bar immediately makes it feel like a completely alternative texture to the rest of the interface. It becomes like, you know, ultra glossy, like black glass compared to the sort of softness of the top bar. Uh, you know, I was actually kind of thinking that this, that was really quite exciting and I, ha I hadn't seen anybody do anything like that. Um, you know, I was playing around with other stuff too. Like this, I guess, is an example of like quite flat, you know, like because uh, things, there were, I guess at that point in time, there were bits popping up, you know, like with people playing with this kind of whole flat design thing. Uh, when I started, I guess everything was, you know, Apple schematic. You know, everything kind of looked like it, what it was meant to do. A notepad looked like a proper notepad with like layers and layers and layers. You know, things were made of wood and glass. And at that time, we thought that's what was super cool. Uh, it's, it just goes to show how rapidly things can evolve. Because like, look where we are now. You know, like we're just the antithesis of that. Everything's completely different. Like now, we're all about the information. Everything is like pared down and it's like the, the sort of a really beautiful delivery of the information, but the information always comes first. Although, as you can see at that point in time, that wasn't really what I was thinking about. Uh, <coughs> you know, we really like this kind of light theme. So uh, one of my first tasks was to start building the new bootloader for Ubuntu. You know, like we'd already known that we are kind of like certainly moving away from that nasty mustard yellow. We're going with these more kind of like rich chocolatey browns like, and like pale creams. Like I already had this kind of bee in my bonnet that I didn't like black and white because I found it very aggressive and very harsh. So we were trying to sort of steer clear of those. But this was quite nice, you know, it was almost like Ubuntu. It's like a bit saintly here, you know, like uh, the loader was really nice. It kind of also created um, like, a, like a physical space to the operating system. So rather than it just existing on a flat TD plane, there was actually, you know, like a depth to it. It felt like you were entering something, you know, like something kind of, I don't know, more physical or metaphysical than just a flat, you know, thing. So played around with that a little bit. Um, this next one, actually, this is like a good example. This is one of my early experimentations and kind of covers quite a lot of things I was just discussing earlier. Like with this, you've got, uh, you know, uh, this is kind of like an overlay from UNR. Like UNR was like a subsection of Ubuntu that I worked on a lot, which was basically to be put out on like, you know, little tiny netbooks and laptops. But so it was a cut down version of Ubuntu, like designed to operate rapidly. But we also were kind of like, well, we know we're deploying it to X million machines. So if we make it look really good, we kind of have a captive audience of people we can just kind of show. Because it's like, the, you know, big vendors like Dell and stuff are committed to like putting it on millions of machines. So <clears throat> this kind of covers, you know, like I was saying, you know, that really, really subtle hexagonal pattern where it's almost like the, 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 it, the, um, uh, you're illuminating stuff but like through the layer that runs in between, sandwiched between two layers of glass. You can kind of see that here and across the top. Um, like my kind of thing about kind of not trying not to use uh, drop shadows and creating a sort of completely fake perspective to everything well, you know like where you're viewing an object yet it's casting a shadow into nothing because actually they're on this surface you know they're not like here so I was experimenting with this it's kind of like well let's make it look like these are the physical objects but they're sitting on a layer of glass and but we can see that reflected through the back of the glass and back again you know so that I was playing around with that a bit here too <coughs> then uh, 
like this is actually like a this is actually like a live version of UNR. So like, although much as that previous slide that I showed you was like you know me experimenting with some things I'd like to do, uh, this one we actually kind of put live. So like, as you can see, I didn't get to really like input much of the stuff that I was thinking, but we started to change this enough that we were kind of starting to fall in line, you know, with some of the ideas that I had. Uh, this next one is just another example about like kind of the extent that I'd have sort of go to like finessing like various different little bits and pieces. Like to be perfectly honest, I don't know if you can probably even see the difference, but it's actually all about the cut between like where the Ubuntu logo is and the main menu starts. It's like, uh, you know, we would do, you know, that's what I guess this, this is a good example, which you probably see quite a lot. It's like, I think when somebody just sees something released, they just don't realize like, how much effort goes into absolutely every little minute of that. You know, like we would spend weeks doing this stuff so that it was absolutely perfect. And people like, might just go like, oh, it just looks like they just did it and they chucked it up. It's like that was just never the case, you know. Um, right, so next thing, uh, we, you know, like, uh, well, I was using OSX for all my design work, always had. So, like, we took a bunch of kind of like, uh, I guess very different sorts of window styles that I could kind of start playing around with, with all the elements kind of on display. You know, you got like check boxes, radio buttons, sliders, you know, like scroll bars, all kinds of stuff there. Uh, and by then I'm, I'm already starting to experiment with different materials, but like we, I think we're still at the stage there where we kind of think we're probably going to end up looking a bit like OSX, but a bit different. So you can see there's kind of, it's much more of a kind of slightly tactile material, you know, like with a little bit of a grain to it. And there's some things a bit, so, you know, the buttons have a different feel. They've got like a different, you know, cut on the edges of them. I suppose I'm experimenting with some quite wacky sliders at that point. Um, but yeah, you know, you can see like, so things would be, you know, I'd knock out loads and loads of these, but things would be quite subtle. Is it like a darker gray? As you can see on this one, deselected windows got like a level of transparency, you know. Uh, I'm experimenting with different, you know, kind of like different sliders again. Uh, here, you know, we're looking at kind of overlay stuff, um, which, I don't know, at that point we thought that that would be quite dark. Like later on I'm going to talk about actually how we sort of flipped it on its head. But at that point in time we kind of thought the overlay thing would be this kind of dark thing. But the things that you were interacting with while you had the overlay active would sort of remain quite illuminated. So, you know, I'm kind of running a bit of a, I can run a search there, I can perform actions on the page, you know, I can kind of like go through my favourites, like while I've got that kind of that browser window open. Yeah, this is just another look at sort of subtlety where instead of having like drop shadows and it feeling layered, in actual fact we've just kind of it completely flat and like the flat overlay layers will just cut straight through like the objects that are sitting behind it, which is quite interesting I think. Um, this is like a kind of further evolution of like UNR experimentation, you know, we're looking at kind of like these little illuminated icons interacting with the sort of like the physical icons that actually feel like they're sitting on the layer above. Uh, what else have we got next? This is a good example, I guess, of the sort of the lengths that we would go to regarding, um, yeah, different like widget elements and stuff. <coughs> um, we really wanted to have like quite a feeling of luxury and I suppose not to just be sort of like a sheet of aluminium or like, like, well, like a MacBook Pro, you know, like Apple are, but actually to experiment with other things. Like I really loved, um, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, the Asian aesthetic it was always been quite important to me and I really liked the idea of kind of lacquering. So we were looking at maybe sort of how could we get that kind of feel of lacquering into things. You know, there's a sort of density to lacquering where the light sort of penetrates to a better depth. You know, like metal's just metal. So like with things like this, you know, like, and I, it's all about, I suppose, with creating the illusion, you know, these, these aren't lacquer, but you can start to make things feel like that quite easily. Uh, and then also looking at kind of, I guess, a more maybe a traditional idea of what could be construed as luxury, you know, like the riches, the richness of like dark leathers, gold, you know, I'm certainly not somebody who's that into gold, but, um, you know, we were exploring that, I guess, kind of using, you know, these little glassy kind of almost like pearl-like, you know, pearl-like buttons rather than just kind of opting for something more simple. Um, yeah, you know, this is the sort of experimentation we would do is just like knock out loads of pages of those, you know, and that as we kind of like them, 
you are, I guess, evolving the process. So you're taking the one that you like and then you're doing like nine more that are the similar, 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 and then you pick one of those and then you nine more. That, but they, so they just become more and more similar. Until like I showed you with those, those uh, top bars before, it's very difficult to even tell what the differences are, but one will stand out. <coughs> Here we go, look, check boxes and radio buttons. Uh, appearing in different levels as well. Actually, this is interesting because by that point, um, we had this kind of like dark and light thing going on, but um, the dark stuff, we had started to think like maybe that was quite good for sort of systemic things, you know, like for the system, we used this like dark material because it felt quite solid and almost like grounding like earth, you know, so is the base layer. And then the sort of neutral interface layer would be on the white and then kind of like floating windows and things like that would be on this sort of slightly warm cream. I mean, I'm still experimenting, you know, like I was saying, I just didn't like the idea of using black and white. Uh, I thought that there was something nice about like uh, bringing the warmth in. I mean, Ubuntu was sort of that mustardy brown and is orange. And I think there's a sort of inherent warmth to that. And we kind of wanted to maintain that. Um, and then the overlay stuff that I was showing you on UNR before as well. So, you know, you can kind of see how each thing would be used and sort of, I guess, be visually similar, but utilizing these different, you know, layers. Right, so, and um, then, I mean, yeah, this was really quite warm. But, um, we were experimenting with having these two themes, uh, <coughs> ambience and radiance, yeah, as a bit of an experiment. Um, we, so we started building these themes out uh, to test live in Ubuntu. Um, yeah, I was working with like a really talented coder to do that. Well, like, and he was actually very good visually too. So like, I didn't really need to second guess him too much. He like, you know, he just develop, and it would pretty much always be pixel perfect to what I was doing. Um, yeah, so we had these two themes, ambience and radiance. Aligning them was actually much more difficult than it looks because they're not just the opposites of each other. There's kind of really quite subtle differences to make them look like they're kind of a happy brother and sister, which is quite a challenge, but an interesting one. Um, and then, like from that, we were also utilizing like those same materials that I showed you from uh, the overlays in UNR for like more physical interacting objects. Like, you know, like I want to resize this window using the overlay structure, but touch. So how, how does touch work? You know, like if I'm using a laptop or something like that. So I'm buzzing through these quite quickly because really this is just the start of the story, but I'm just setting a bit of the groundwork. Uh, then the overlay stuff actually went through this, you know, I think I was saying earlier, like a smoky kind of gray period where we hadn't got this kind of, uh, further down the line we established this, things that are really up high are light and things that down low are dark. But back then we were like, don't know which way it should work. So we had this kind of like smoky table, 80s table thing going on. Um, but actually, I think we, think we were the first person, people to work out like, yeah, we should just like blur everything behind. It'll be cool because it makes everything feel like it's on top. Um, Mark actually decided to sort of just blab about, well not blab, but like release a load of these ideas in like a talk because he was just really excited I think. We've been working secretly on it for a year. But really the problem was is that like we just, although we had like some fantastic ideas, like we weren't as agile as somebody like Apple who had 20 times more um, designers and developers than we did. You know, so he kind of said some cool things and lo and behold four or five months later, they appeared in like OS X, you know, on iOS. Uh, and there was really nothing we can do about it. What we should have done was like said nothing and just launched it straight out and never been like, oh my God, where did that come from? You know, but uh, I guess he was excited and just wanted to tell the world. Um, yeah, just another example of that, but with like more complex kind of, you know, informational structure. Me experimenting more with like kind of these ongoing layers of like smoky glass, you know, like electricity through glass, like white stuff. Uh, looking at kind of, uh, you know, uh, every aspect of the interface, like we, ha we, you know, went into such incredible detail with, you know, like whole teams of people would spend ages. It's kind of like, well, we did with this thing, we were looking at like, okay, so you're kind of basically going to manually tab through the items in the menu bar, like how are we going to represent that? You know, like, should it be like this? Should it be in the center? Should it be in the corner? Should it be big? Should it be small? Like, what's it going to look like? What kind of material is it? You know, all these questions for every single aspect of the operating system, like the, the amount of work that has to be done is like, is vast. Um, and uh, like, this one's quite interesting. This is like when we started to look at overlay tiles. So. 
where you know the user can define um, a loads of tiles that like I guess surface information that they may be personally interested in. You know, you can have things like timers, you can have things like the weather, you can have like reminders for bits and pieces. But um, this one in particular, like, is probably interesting because further down the line, you quite a lot of this stuff stands out. Like um, uh, further down the process, we started like this idea of you know the electricity in the glass, but through this this grid, and you can kind of see the grid subtly in the background there. And then also tessellation like comes uh, to the fore as well, and you can see that like it's very subtle, but it's kind of there. But it's creating a matrix which all the objects in the interface align to, um, and like structure, you know, and it positions everything, but makes everything sort of feel cohesive and together. It's very subtle, but it works really elegantly, I think. Uh, and that this is just me experimenting with sort of like various different types of material. It's you know I'm looking at like well how much does it blur behind it? Like what does the edge do to the you know like how does that affect it? What does it make the material feel like? I mean it was cool. Like I, what, this is what I spend my days doing is just experimenting, and then trying to work out I suppose how to visually fake as much stuff as possible, and in a way that we could actually run it. Uh, within an operating system, because sometimes I'll be like, let's do that, and they'll be like, there's no way we can do that, because like, the processing power required to sort of move a window, if you've got all that stuff going on, it's like not going to happen, particularly not on like, the low-end machines, because we, what was great about Ubuntu is actually it would pretty much run on anything. You, know, you can put it on like, an old laptop, and it, it's snappy. You know, something that wouldn't run a reasonable version of Windows or Mac, you know, put Ubuntu on it, and all of a sudden it's become like a kind of younger version, you know, like, like it's had yeah, <laughs> like it's had Botox or something, you know, it looks 20 years younger, it works twice as fast. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, this is an example of like some design thinking we were doing around the, the login screen. I mean, I don't know if any of you guys have seen the login screen as it stands. I think it's probably still re relatively similar, but it changed quite a lot. You know, we were looking at like uh, these little uh, informational widgets that I was just talking about. Like maybe even having a little like notepad if you need to rough out a note, uh, you know, uh, multi, you know, how to sign multiple people in, guest accounts, and having this kind of, you know, how does the environment feel? Is it two D, pseudo two D, three D? You know, it was all just playing around. Uh, this is uh, well, yeah. This is like me actually sort of totally refining how all of the windows in Ubuntu feel, and then we actually built all of this out. So like, this, this was all live stuff, you know, we built all the graphics for that. Uh, and then, oh, we've had that one already, haven't we? There we have. Okay, so now we're on to some new stuff. Right. Uh, okay. Oh God, I've only been on, have I been only been on 15 minutes? Or is that half an hour? Right, yeah, sorry, I've just literally got to work out which presentation I need to show first. Uh, actually, I think this is quite a bit of a one. How do I... No. How do I put it into presentation mode? Yeah. Uh, oh, there we go, sorry. <clears throat> so yeah, we're going to start showing you like you know some of the slide decks that we used to show, and also I guess the development of Ubuntu Siri. So um, at this point, like our project goal: create a visual language that establishes a strong and unique identity for Ubuntu's digital products, that incorporates the brand's values and its intention to become a world-leading platform. I think by that point as well, like, I kind of also had my workload tripled. Like when my boss was like, yeah, yeah, I kind of think it'd be really cool if we did like a, you know, like a mobile and a tablet as well as a desktop. And I was like, yeah, Ace, maybe we could kind of think about maybe employing some other people to help me instead of it. I was the only person doing all visual design. Uh, oh, yeah, no, this is cool, this one. This is, uh, so this is actually the beginning of Ubuntu Suru. So um, there's a bit of backstory to this. Like, uh, um... Right, let me think, what's the best way to talk about this? Right, so I'd always had like a real interest in the kind of Asian aesthetic. Uh, as a kid, I'd um, actually had like a Japanese friend, Mahoko, at school, and she had taught me um, all uh, traditional origami, 
And like, I, I kind of always kind of had that with me. I just saw it as like really beautifully elegant like, you know, and simplistic kind of uh, way to turn a kind of nothing sheet of paper into something incredible. You know, and um, I don't know, like it's amazing. About two weeks ago, uh, some Japanese ladies uh, where we work asked if I could take a photo of them. I took a photo of them. Um, they came to visit the site because it's a heritage site. And one of the ladies came up to me when I finished and she gave me like an origami butterfly and it was just such an elegant like little gift, you know, like to say thank you for me taking a photo. Uh, I was kind of like totally blown away by that. It reminded me of like that, that sort of aspect of things from when I was a kid. But yeah, so I've always admired like the Asian aesthetic. Like to me, uh, European and Asian are like, um, well not to odds, but they're just incredibly different. Like uh, the European aesthetic is, uh, I don't know, not regimented, but like um, very ordered, you know, like the way we looked at art, the way we looked at architecture. Uh, everything had its place and we kind of like created mathematical principles to put things in their place, you know, like um, to work out, you know, the sweet spots in the picture, to work out the best way to structurally support these huge, huge pillars that we used to like making in these huge ostentatious buildings. Um, it was actually like, it were very different to like the Asian aesthetic, which is much more, I guess, about like natural flow and um, incorporation of nature into, uh, <coughs> into like, you know, into your natural life, into the home, like even into technology, like uh, even here in Singapore, I can see it a lot, you know, like, um, like the living walls and the trees that are growing out of the buildings. I mean, you don't see any of this in the UK, but here it's just, it's just kind of, the norm, you know, that there's that very strong integration between, oops, between nature and technology. Yeah, what's going on? Mm. Oh. So, oh, why is it jumped loads? Oh, it's jumped loads of pages, right, sorry, let me go back. Um, and yeah, I actually started being quite obsessed with that. I mean, I'd, uh, I could show you my, actually, I could show you my Pinterest, just so you understand what I'm talking about. Uh, right, so. Uh. <coughs> uh, no, I don't need to. Right, so, um, like, uh, yeah, so it isn't just, I guess, kind of art and design that I was talking about, but like even things kind of like Ikebana, I did, I'll show you some things, I don't know if you'd be familiar with them. Ikebana is like um, Japanese, uh, right, okay, all right, yeah, continue. Sorry. Right. Uh. Right, okay, it was just loading. Yeah, so um, apologies for that. I just kind of thought I'd take a little diversion because it's kind of really cool stuff. So, uh, and it, why I got so excited with it because I was kind of like, oh, you know, as a designer, I was like, wow, this is like some of the coolest stuff I've, I've ever seen. Like, how did I not know about all this stuff before? I guess as a child, I touched on origami, as I was saying, but like this just opened my eyes, you know, like to just a very, very different way of thinking about design and like appreciating things. Um, yeah, so Ikebana is like uh, Japanese flower arranging and it's just, it's so alternative to like the way that you might, you know, like, uh, I don't know how things are here, but like in the UK, you give a bunch of flowers and it's like roses and it's big and it's circular and it's like very like, ooh, decorative. Like this is just um, like, to me, like incredibly beautiful and like way more artistic and utilizes the kind of space and form and everything, like uh, not more effectively, but just in such a different way. I, uh, maybe it's just that's because, you know, that's why I like it so much is because it is so different. So it's like new and refreshing to me. Um, you know, I mean, I've talked to people about that and they've been like, what, flower arranging, isn't that? Like, that's like really girly. And I'm like, no, you should kind of check it out. Because like, actually, I think it, uh, it's traditionally Japanese like men who do Ikebana. You know, it's actually looked upon as sort of like, not, well, not predominantly masculine thing, but certainly not just like a girl's thing. Ben, what the fuck are you laughing at me so much for? Uh, uh, oh, right. So, uh, Kyoko, is that okay? Yeah, both. That, well, that's what I just said. Yeah, okay. So, you know, I'm, well, I'm just going to show you some of the stuff. So, so you know, like, as you can see, it's just, it's a very different way of thinking. Um, but there's like, you know, there's also, although you can't see it here, because everything maybe looks like a little bit, random and it isn't like you know uh, you know I've read lots of books on it and there's actually like uh, a lot of rules that need to be followed you know like which if you don't follow if people people who knew what they were talking about would look at it and be like no 
but uh, you, you can't see it. You know, like they're so alternative, but there are ways that there, there are specific ways that you do things. Uh, so that's that's a cabana. Then, oh God, why is it doing this? Sorry, I apologise. Uh, I suppose it's because I wasn't planning on showing this. So, right. I don't even know why it needs me to log in. Um, then there was like uh, Wabakusa and Kokodama. So uh, that, that's really interesting. That's like basically, um, and it's totally logical. You know, us in Europe thought it'd be a great idea. Like you want to you plant, you want to plant in the house. So then you put the plant in a pot. It's like, so yeah, yeah, you know, like we take a little plug of the earth and we stick it in a pot and we stick it in the house. Seems sort of to us like the logical thing to do. Um, yeah, the Japanese and Chinese were like, we just actually thought about it like a, even more logically and goes like, well, actually, if we get the soil that the plant came out of and we mix it with some sphagnum moss, which is natural anyway, but will mean that it can retain more moisture, and then we create a ball out of it. Uh, in actual fact, it's more aerated. It's you know, like it's better than a pot. Like the plant's happier. It can't even really tell that it's not just still in the earth because it just doesn't know. And it sort of roots for some reason because it's a sphere. They just sort of bounce around inside. It's um, plants actually grow. I think two and a half times ha more happily and established more quickly if they're grown in like a ball of Japanese clay and sphagnum moss than they do if they're grown in a pot. So. Well, Wabakusa is that principle, but based on plants from the water margin. So you use plants that would grow on the riverbank. So you can actually just do these. You can go down to the riverbank, you can get a ball of clay, mix it with some sphagnum moss, wrap it with like some fine twine, and then find some plants and pick, push them into the thing and then just put it in a dish. And the beauty of it is like actually it's, um, it's about the chaos of nature. So it's the, the, their, their idea and principle is that it doesn't really matter. Like whatever happens, it'll be beautiful because nature is beautiful. So the way it grows, you just admire it for that. You know, you're not trying to, it's not like, again, a big difference. It's not like in London, uh, in, London in the UK where, for example, you're heavily pruning your rose bush because you have to have it fitting into a particular way. You don't want it growing suckers on it. And this is just like, that's how it is and it's always beautiful because nature is beautiful and we just incorporate that we don't try to tame it and control it which is something I really love so very quick look at Wabakusa <coughs> some of these are unbelievable it's like a, I'm gonna be making lots of these soon I think <laughs> uh, you know I'll just scroll through but you kind of get the idea you're utilizing like mosses very small plants and then maybe with some grasses and things, but things that you can find naturally. But like to me, that they're more beautiful really than any kind of like uh, forced flower arrangement you could find. Right then, Kokodama, which is the same. I'll show very briefly. But the, with these, it's more about uh, it's not about the water margin. So these are just the you know the ball of clay with the plants inserted into them, and some mosses. I mean that one's incredible. <coughs> And actually that example at the top, that's kind of Swazeki. Swazeki is kind of like bonsai, but it's the appreciation of, of um, like a, a stone that's been found from the river, but in the same way that you would like kind of look and appreciate a bonsai. And then aquascaping, which is like uh, something that I actually have started to do, but I've, obviously because I've just moved here now, I'm gonna have to reestablish myself and start making some new tanks. That's kind of, um, basically a bit like a Zen garden, but in water. So it's utilizing a fish tank, but the focus is not on the fish. Again, like a very big difference between like in Europe, I guess we would always have big fish, not many plants. With this, it's the creation of a, you know, like a, almost like a Zen garden aesthetic. Uh, and the fish are secondary, you know, they're, they're just enjoying being part of the art. Uh, I mean, some of them are like truly incredible. Like, uh, was it Iwa, 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 I'm just trying to think, was it Iwaguma? style tanks like those are literally like enormous zen gardens where you, the principle is you have five stones from the king stone down to like the pawn and the way you, you arrange them has to create perfect balance within the environment it's like really interesting if you have you know if you find that sort of beautiful i really suggest you investigate it that's what happened to me it's like i started investigating and i just like sucked into the whole thing uh, and then started spending loads of money that I didn't need to on buying all these kinds of bits and pieces to play around with. Right, so now I will go back to these. So <clears throat> I, I, I think hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea with like where, why I started to think about all of these ideas. You know, like it just seemed beautiful to me and alternative. And also 
Uh, I mean, I already had like a background in European design, so I just thought it was, you know, I should be embracing all of this. Uh, and there was another thing too, like uh, I'll tell you about, which um, uh, I had always like really, as a, you know, I was saying about well, liking science fiction as a boy, I'd always like, like really admired the Wayland Katani company from Aliens, uh, like all the alien films. And the, re and the, the reason it appealed to me with this, uh, this Ubuntu project is, um, you know, we wanted to appeal to everybody, everybody across the globe. So like we needed to be like, what's the word? Like, well, not even pan, pan European Asian, as in like, and of any age group. Because, you know, we were trying to create a logo, create colors, pick colors, create a brand, make an interface that, you know, a boy or a girl of 14 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or a grandmother or a grandfather would actually look at and like think that it was, they didn't have to think it's amazing. You know, we had like our target demographics, but we wanted to appeal to such a broad spectrum of people. They all had to think it looked okay. It's actually a very hard thing to do. Um, but I, I kept thinking back to the Wayland Katani because like they were like um, the name. I mean, it's half European, it's half Asian, yeah? Um, in the later films, it became Wayland. They dropped the Katani. But, um, they weren't just like pan-global, they were like just universal. You know, this company with like a very simple motif and a, like a really nice branding, but uh, they, it was literally, they didn't just appeal to everybody on the earth, they, they, it was a brand that everybody could relate to across the entire universe. I really like that. <coughs> so we'll go back to this stuff now. So like, the, yeah, this is, you know, the, you can see this is my doodles. Like that's what we used to do often, like have meetings, like uh, post-it notes, roughly the shape of mobile phone bash stuff out really quickly. You know, what I'm looking at here is kind of like, oh, how are you going to lock your phone? Well, you know, I was showing you the grid earlier. We're liking the grid, so there's little fine dots of stuff. Bit Zen garden, you know, here. Oh, maybe I could actually be using like this whole massive grid of my phone rather than the sort of nine dot thing to unlock. I can use the entire phone, you know, to create my unlock pattern. So it's really, really difficult to duplicate. Uh, oh, right, that's not going to go slide by slide, is it? <clears throat> looking at proper Zen garden stuff, so can I play with it, you know, like can I actually unlock the little objects in the middle, uh, more random thinking, looking at kind of tessellation too, you know, like I was saying from like um, my developments with uh, origami as a kid, we really like this idea that uh, information could be folded. So rather than things existing on this one plane of the front of the interface, like the, yeah, the information could be folded and hidden and utilized when needed. Uh, the one on the left is actually this, um, uh, what's it, it's not the compound, yeah, compound, it's called compound tetrahedra. It's like a mathematical model and you can kind of make it as origami, but basically it can be rotated infinitely. And I really like that. It's kind of like, uh, it kind of represented lots of different things to me, but it was like infinite. So it could be kind of set up as a locking, rotatable locking system, but it can also be unfolded out into something. And like, I like that because I, I was started to think, well, if we started to use origami and layering in our interfaces, we can kind of hide stuff. So, you know, like you're interacting on one plane, but in fact, nobody really knows that you've hidden another one, which is sort of here inside, but you can pull it out whenever you want and interact with that and then hide it again. So what we're actually gaining is almost like this 3D interface where these other things are like hidden in between. Or, you know, like things are hidden on layers in between and like say, rather than um, something like um, a radio button, you know, existing on one plane, it could actually be like three layers. So you've got, yeah, the surface and then the cut in and then the radio buttons in between and it all feels like kind of either paper cut or paper mechanics or, you know, the sort of subtle layering stuff really appealed. And like at that point, at that point in time when we were starting to think about all that stuff, nobody was even doing that. Um, I think you can kind of see like a lot of that, uh, you know, has come out in things like material design, you know, that very subtle layering and um, prioritization of information through that very subtle layering kind of did happen anyway. Uh, I guess this is when, you know, start to go into Photoshop, refine how things could look, you know, that's a bit more like, oh yeah, that's the subtle sort of compound of tetrahedra. This is like we're starting to look at tessellation. Um, this is really like, this is more elegant tessellation. Actually, this one on the right hand side, I uh, uh, found this cushion which was completely tessellated, but obviously looked like a cushion, so it was squishy, but it would only kind of move in triangles, which I really wowed me, but it had this kind of like subtle red stitching on it that I liked. Uh, I don't know, this, this looks quite random, but like um, one of the things I was thinking of that were really cool is like, uh, say if you're in a browser window and you search for something, 
uh, while search is happening, so while you're between pages, actually the, the page becomes fluid, uh, but in a tessellated fluid, you know, like paper layer. So it like undulates literally like water. And then as soon as the page becomes loaded, that's when it go, turns back into a flat surface. Uh, yeah, yeah, do you, you, you know what I mean? So like it, it's kind of, when it's in flux, you actually get to see that it isn't totally flat, but then you don't notice it when it is, when, when you, you can actually interact with it. Right, it's me more playing with some widget bits and pieces there. Uh, ah, that, this, is, this is interesting, because uh, I think as I was saying before, we were having a lot of trouble like, working this out, but we actually sort of started to get to the point where we knew what we were talking about then, where <coughs> this, this was the layering of the interface, so like, uh, kind of referred to as the substrate. So if it was system, it was dark and it was at the bottom, and it was like, you know, grey, but like with slight warmth to it, that kind of earthy colour. And then as you went through the operating system, like through the apps, it would be lighter, and the overlays would be lighter still. You know, we actually, we, it was a kind of a bit of a eureka moment. We actually had some logic to these things that we've been like playing around with for ages. Um, oh yeah, and this was like a real defining moment as well. Like, uh, I'm, I don't know if any of you use Ubuntu, but like it's very unlikely you will have noticed this, but um, uh, do you, I don't know if you know about the Ubuntu font. We worked with like a company called Dalton Marg, which is a, like a real top, like world-renowned font foundry to create the Ubuntu font. And the Ubuntu font is like a complicated font anyway. Because um, uh, Canonical, the company that owns Ubuntu, is also made from the Ubuntu font. But Canonical uses the caps of the font and Ubuntu uses, you know, the, the lowercase letters. They both have like actually very different personalities as companies. And um, it was like a really big design challenge to, you know, for Dalton Marg to try to represent these two companies in the same font. And it's a beautiful font. I mean, like, uh, we did so much testing on it at like small sizes or on mobile or on screen. It's incredibly legible. But um, if you were to blow it up till each letter's like six feet high, you just see that the whole thing's like very, very subtle curves that you weren't aware of when you looked at the letter like that. You know, there's, it's, it's really elegant. Um, but like, uh, uh, I just came up with this idea. I was kind of like, um, well, what if like everything was sort of, everything echoed the font? And they're, they're like, well, you know, everybody else in design, she's like, well, what do you mean? And I was like, well, why don't we, you know, like, say when we're building like vector icons and things like that, why don't we actually kind of start building it from pieces of the font? You know, so you don't really notice it, but like um, <laughs> indicator icons, the curves of the indicator icons, like points on the indicator icons are actually fully echoed within the font because they're made of the font. You know, so rather than it just being, um, you know, something's a rectangle with a 45 degree point on it, it's not. It's like it's, it's inherited all of the subtle curves from the font. So when you just look at it, you don't really think about it, but it just feels like everything just belongs, automatically belongs together. You know, like they're just all part and parcel of the same creature. Uh, and as far, as far as I'm aware, like nobody else has like, really ever done that, like thought to incorporate, you know, the font shapes into other things. Uh, <coughs> You can kind of see it here. Let me, I don't know if I can zoom in on that bit. But like things like, you know, there's the subtle curves here are taken from the letters. Like the curves here come from the D, uh, you know, the alphabet. The radiuses of here are like are taken from the font. You know, as it, what it does is it just, because it echoes it, it just all looks completely comfortable next to any like numbers or letters. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, don't know what that one is. Ah. Oh. Um, also, yeah, looking, I don't know, just more organics, kind of like, I had this, like, thing, um, and this is another interesting thing to talk about, like, uh, I had this, real, this idea that I really wanted everybody's uh, experience to be, like, part of a big family, like, everybody's an Ubuntu user, but also to be individual, so, like, how could we do that, um, you know, could I do something like this, where basically, the first time you flip on the phone, it's going to pretty much like generate a uh, wallpaper for you, which you think is like just the default wallpaper, but it's not. It's like, you know, it's a, a permutation, uh, like a one in a billion, but using like an algorithm, you know, uh, really, really appealed to me. So um, like one of the first things that Mark said to me when I joined Ubuntu is he's like, well, Otto, it's just, it's super, super important. That like, you know, like uh, if I'm standing here at the airport, for example, I'm looking right down the hall, um, I can tell that the person at the other end of the room is using Ubuntu if they're using the default theme. If I happen to walk past somebody and I look over their shoulder, 
I can tell they're using Ubuntu. You know, if they're holding their phone, and I mean, it, we were just referring to the default thing because obviously people, people start to customize. Yeah. Can't tell. Uh, otherwise, you're relying on the hardware. But um, he's like, I, you know, I just want to, and I was like, oh, I think that's like a, that's the way we should be looking at it. It's like a brilliant idea, you know. Um, but yeah, I was kind of like, well, how could we do that? Because I, I was just like, it'd be so cool. It's like, if you, particularly if you don't even realize, is that you kind of see other people going like, yeah, but it's not the wallpaper I've got. And then like, you sort of start to realize, they're like, oh no, it's like your own wallpaper. Not tell anybody. Uh, and in actual fact, I did do, like, um, we were really quite close to being able to do that. I did launch this wallpaper, which was actually just um, like a bunch of faded lights. Uh, and it was weird because like, I, <laughs> Um, we were doing that. We were, I think we were writing it in uh, like a sort of sub, like cut down version of Inkscape with, attached with some other bits and pieces that some developer had come up with. So it's like really, really cut down little machine that would basically take these elements, uh, you know, like use an algorithm, create a completely randomly generated example of it. And we got quite close to actually getting it in the distro, but we didn't. And so like I kind of made one version of this wallpaper and then we released it and I got like trolled to death because they were kind of like, all you've done is stick some radial gradients <laughs> on like a background and released it. Uh, and I was, uh, we actually, because uh, it was all sort of quite secret, I couldn't even kind of defend myself. I just had to take it, it was really bad. Um, because it, in fact, the, the idea was amazing. It would have been, you know, like, and people would have really got it and I think been quite wowed. But what they actually did was just troll me to death. Um, and go like, yeah, well, you don't even look like you can design and you just stick some things on a page and I guess that's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and looking more at these kind of wallpapers, texture, important I think because of all the other stuff I've shown you, I think that's like a particularly poor example of how it could look like on <laughs> the desktop. Uh, right, okay, let's do away with that one. Uh, this is nice, we'll touch on this quickly. This is like ideas that I have for icons. So um, I think as I was showing to you before, I like the idea that like, rather than looking at the desktop as like some kind of like weirdly morphed kind of thing where you're looking at it, it's a window here, but like although you've got like a desktop there which is flat and folders there, for some weird reason they seem to be casting shadows onto nothing here, you know, and then stacked vertically. I was like, let's, you know, let's just actually kind of think about it a bit more logically and make it a bit more kind of physical and maybe understandable. And so I started to think around this kind of like, how can we do the icons on the desktop like that? So these kind of container things and like um, everything had been about light. So I started to think about lenses, you know, like kind of like, I don't know, concave, convex lenses, how light, light is tran transmitted through glass at like various levels. You know, we had these different materials. We had this smoky glass we've been playing with. We had the overlay layers that cast their own light. Uh, you know, to me, this had been the traditional viewing angle of somebody using a computer, like inherently when computers were like big, and I guess that's probably actually a more modern version, but you know, like when monitors used to literally be like these huge ass TVs like that, that weighed an absolute ton, CRT monitors. That's the way you looked at a computer. Um, but I started, to, I started to say, well, yeah, but this isn't the way we use computers anymore. Like, you know, we're interfacing with them like that if it's a desktop computer, but then if it's a tablet, it's like here or it's like that. Or if it's a mobile phone, it's kind of anywhere between this kind of like, like more like that, you know, and anywhere in between. So maybe it was a bit wrong that we're trying to cast shadows onto things when in actual fact, like if I'm viewing it like that, the shadow's certainly not being cast down here somewhere, you know, and if I'm doing it like that, it equally, I'm looking at it and it's sitting on a surface. Why is the shadow, you know, it just all seemed a bit wrong. Obviously, these are little things that probably most people don't even really worry about, but when you're designing like an OS or something like every, like I was saying to you earlier, every single thing is something that you like, you, you worry about and think about to that level of detail. So, you know, we started to think about like, you know, these lenses and lenses were like, we like lenses because like, uh, we had this whole glass thing going on, but also lenses seem to us like searching, I guess traditionally, you know, like the magnifying glass, the lenses. So we kind of had that as a bit of a start point. We got this like glassy lens for search. And then we kind of like going from that, you went to like neutral flat surfaces. So like very flat objects, folders, you know, like, I don't know why I decided to put a speaker there. Uh, it's like five years ago, so can't blame me for not remembering. Uh, envelopes, and then like very shallow indented surfaces, I guess like a notice board with a raised edge and some photos on it, possibly a stack of post-it notes. 
But then I think the things that I got really excited about was um, like the deeper indented surfaces, you know, like, because uh, if we were having this thing where we actually did have objects sitting on it, so it was this layer of glass where the information was sort of behind, just behind the glass, and the object was on top. I quite like the idea of these boxes. And like, maybe even folders should be like that, so a bit like a toy box. So rather than it be not really knowing what's inside of it, you'd actually get an idea of the contents because you, you would see some of the contents from the box inside it, you know, like the ones that we use most often. Um, it just seemed like a really, you know, uh, sort of quite nice, like, but physical way of, uh, uh, you know, identifying things really rapidly and visually. Uh, and yeah, things like, I guess, storage boxes, you know, like when you're compressing files, actually, you actually get like something that's like a bit like a storage box, you know, because everything's been squashed in. Uh, and then I guess that's an example of a combination surface from using like a lens, but then also like an indented surface. Just, just showing because I mean, if you're going to start designing all icons, you're going to make like, you know, about 4,000 of them minimum. So you, you need to have at least have some freedom to sort of use more than one thing rather than make, make four rules and then you're completely fucked because you're like, well, what about this and what about that? How do you represent that? And we didn't think of this and, you know. Um, so some very, very quick sketches of mine of, you know, like the, this is how the lenses could look and that's the kind of how maybe the TV surface could look. The lenses actually kind of went on to define, you know, like the menu items in Ubuntu became like that. So um, if it isn't like a fully predefined icon, uh, the icon gets sandwiched between three layers, uh, like semi-transparent layers and turned into, you know, like encapsulated within one of those sort of glass objects. It was quite nice. And when I found that icon, I just thought that was really fun as well. You know, like, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, basket. Thanks, Reese. Uh, <laughs> uh, right, let me think. What's going to be the. Bit? How are we doing for time as well? Two minutes. I've got two minutes? Oh, man. Like, well, I've got so much more cool stuff to show you. That's why I'm Oh. Uh, yeah, because I mean, we've just been setting the stage. Uh, okay, so like, I'm really, really, really quickly just going to kind of show you some of the evolution of stuff, which hopefully you will have seen reflected in a lot of things I've been talking about. Like, this is lots of the layering, and like here you can see loads of it, right? Uh, you know, we haven't got much origami going, but we've got like uh, layers of paper with translucency. You can see the grid I was talking about and the tessellation in the background, which sandwiches everything together. Uh, interactive elements are like done as a three layer thing where the top layer is like static, but actually it's the second layer that's almost like paper mechanics, it slides. And the layer that you see is the third layer through. Um, which to me, like, I really loved this stuff. I thought it was like really, really beautiful and echoed a lot of the Asian aesthetic stuff that I showed you earlier. Um, so these are more, you know, more examples like rollers and things for all of that stuff because you know, we used to have to check out so many different things. Sliders. Uh, where's the... F okay, let me just try and find you full colour sliders. Is it really... I've only got like none minutes. Uh, you're over. Oh, no. Right, okay. Uh, you want right. questions? <laughs> <laughs> Q&A, anybody? I'm sorry, I'd like so much more stuff to show you, like three times more stuff, but... Yeah, so I don't know if anybody's got any questions or not. Or cool. I, I, I have a question, yeah. So I'm like thinking about as you're working with a client. Yeah. Like, how do you get the inspiration for the design? Like, what are some of the key questions? Because I'm imagining everyone's, you know, out developing apps yeah. and trying to think about what the experience is going to be. So, like. so I guess what if. Are the key things you well, the first thing, if I meet a client, probably the first thing I do would like to, I'd like to understand the landscape. So I understand like who they are, what they're about. But then I want to also know their competitors because, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not really interested unless I'm coming in 110% compared to their competitors. Although it's not even worth it, really. You know, so like understand the landscape, see the competitors, basically be like, well, we're just going to be better than your competitors for starters. Um, I think like it depends on the how established the brand is. It's like to define colours and things like that. Um, like uh, often, I think like uh, the first few meetings, like if you get if you're doing something particular, well, that on that scale is just ridiculous. You know, that's like years and years of work. But like um, even with like designing an app or something, the, the first meeting is often very very scary. I'm not somebody who like I hate it. Like when somebody says to me. Can you do, you know, can you do three designs of this that feel different? Because my brain doesn't work like that. It's like I, I'm kind of like doing this, and then I'm, I'm by doing that, I'm kind of creating a direction as I go, 
and that just is going, you know, I'm not creating three of these where my brain's thinking like about three totally different design styles. I don't operate like that. So like usually I won't work with people if they say that to me. Um, I just do one and it evolves. So yeah, often the first one is difficult and like hopefully you don't make a total mistake like where you, you, know, you put a stab in the dark and the client's like, I don't like it at all. But I mean, that happens very rarely. It's probably only happened to me a couple of times. Because hopefully you've asked them enough questions and they have some kind of brand. So like, you know kind of what, what you, where you're going where you have like leeway. I don't know if that does that answer the question. Yeah. Um, but then I'm surprised that you look at based on what I've seen here. I'm actually surprised you look at competitors. Uh, it's almost like you're so. It seems like you're so different. Oh yeah, well, we're, we're equally that. Like, I mean, I think. Um, I mean, I've always like kept an eye what's going on, but then equally so that you don't do that. But then. Uh, I think I'm quite good at not being heavily influenced by what I see and just going like, oh, I don't want to do that, but I want it to be green, you know. But uh, I think you have to definitely be aware of that so that, you, well, like I said, to me, if anything, the most important factor would be like, how good is it? How good are your competitors? Because like, we're just going to have to be better. We have to be better. Because otherwise, what's the point? You know, like really, you know, like, no point in going in and going like, oh, I'll do this for you, but we're going to be 90% as good as your competitors. It's like, do 110 or better, or why bother? But that's, you know, like, I guess the way I try to look at it. <coughs> uh, yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, you have applied uh, this concept to Uldu. Sorry? You have applied this concept to Uldu. Uh, yeah, I mean, if I'd shown you some of the newer stuff, a lot of it was applied to yeah. Ubuntu. How do these things go, go with Samarik? Uh, these concepts, what you applied for Uldu. Yeah. Uh, How do they... Uh, you applied this concept to Samarik design. Uh, well, I've only, like, uh, but at the moment, like the stuff that I'm working that we're using, we're doing in Xamarin, like uh, I'm designing it as both iOS and Android. So like I'm utilizing iOS and material design. So like that was like, that's like a total another thing, isn't it? It's like you've got iOS material design and then like that was Ubuntu, you know? So you don't get to apply something like that to Xamarin. I mean, um, interesting, like, well, I don't know, I could show you really briefly, but uh, talking of... Good five minutes. Have I? No, uh, sorry. Nice one. Cut me short, motherfucker. <laughs> I'm running into you. Uh, right, no, no. So actually, like, it's funny you should say Xamarin because like, uh, I actually did, a, like, for David, my friend, who was like, um, uh, who was, uh, right, so this, like, was um, uh, an idea that I had for Xamarin. Like, uh, they were like, Otto, we really want, we're doing this, like, thing, but we want to take on, strange enough, Microsoft, Microsoft having this huge conference, we want to be quite disruptive, what can we do to be disruptive? And I was like, yeah, all right, well, let me have a think about it. So I was kind of like, um, okay, so like, what I liked about like, uh, Xamarin is like, they were like, well, we've got this whole life cycle, and I was like, ah, interesting, life cycle. Uh, <coughs> started to think like, well, what, what's, what, what is a life cycle, and what is, you know, like kind of evolution, and like, ah, oh, like DNA, that's the, you know, the key of evolution and life cycle. And then I was kind of like, oh, it's kind of interesting because actually the, the X of the Xamarin part, like kind of a bit like, like you know, like the uh, X chromosome, like maybe you can kind of take that and like do that. So, and then I started start thinking like, well, actually this is like quite wicked. Like I, I've been really into generative art. So um, I'm always surrounded by like loads of developers and coders. So I was like, wow, this could be really cool. Cause what we could do is, you know, like we could set this thing up where you've got like a bunch of little sliders, you slide them around and you hit go and it generates you this kind of like totally personalized DNA, uh, you know, structure that you can kind of, you don't have, if you don't like it, just do it again. You know, keep tampering with the sliders until you find a pattern that you really like. And I thought that that was really, really like to me descriptive of what, the, you know, this fundamental they'd said to me is like, yeah, we're life cycle, you know, and I like this DNA thing. But I thought it was subtle, but also like it, it didn't detract from their logo, but it just enhanced it. Uh, <laughs> so then, I'll just show you, know, this is an example of the kind of permutations. I was just like, this is fucking wicked, it's really beautiful. But then they were like, yeah, also it is really nice, but the problem is it's like going to be mega expensive. Because like, I was like, let's get this thing on site, you know, like we'll make the app. People come up, out pops their totally individual t-shirt. I was like, this is great. And then they're were, they were like, you all wear it and you go to this Microsoft event and you're all disruptive, you know, like again with... Um, and that sounds great. And then, but then I was like, oh, actually, I can top it off because I've just watched Iron Man. So uh, I kind of think, like, fuck it, let's make it like the Tony Stark centerpiece. Um, and this is a thing I did for them quite a few years ago. And I don't know if you've noticed that some of their T-shirts kind of look a bit like that. And they never paid me for this one, actually. 
Yeah, they never used it. But like, have you know the green T-shirts? Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, but yeah, no. So that's. That, I guess you mentioned Xamarin, so I just thought I would bring that up. You know, like I mean, I love their products and stuff, but I just thought it's quite a funny story. I, I just, if anything, I get a thing with this one. Sorry, I was just slightly disappointed. Slightly disappointed that. Um, it didn't happen because I was so excited about it. It would have been like a really, really like a showpiece for me, you know? And it just looked brilliant. And like the, everything worked. It's like, you know, their logo was the chromosome. It was, it, you know, it, it, everything was logical in my head. So I was just very sad it didn't happen. Any other questions? Yes? I'm curious, uh, what, what kind of software do you use? Uh, I mean, to be honest, like my baby is Photoshop originally. Like uh, I've been using Photoshop since Photoshop 2 which is going back some time, didn't even have layers, you know, like if you made a selection, you let go of it, that was it, you're fucked if you made a mistake. Um, and then Illustrator, uh, but I mean, I can do bits and pieces, I mean, I, I, I used, when I used to build websites, I was like uh, really in the kind of whole big flash animation movement when everybody did that, I can do a bit of After Effects, I mean, Photoshop is my baby. Now, to be honest, like, um, and I was kind of late to the game, uh, I've been using Sketch a lot for like, because it's just so fast. You know, and I'm starting to, uh, I mean, I'm not a developer, like my brain, I can work very, very effectively conveying my ideas and working on ideas and, uh, you know, bringing things together with developers, but uh, I'm not, a, you know, like I'm not, and I kind of, I think as you grow older, you probably like realise, do what you're best at, don't really waste time doing stuff that you're not that good at, work with the people who can do that to a really high level, so that you all just make each other better, you know? Um, yeah, so that's what I say. Like, yeah, I kind of it, it took me a while to get into Sketch, but like now I see the power of that. Like with rapid uh, UI development, way over Photoshop because I can bash out like thirty screens in the t time that it would take me to do about two in Photoshop. Um, and beyond that, I guess like I quite like any little tool that will do something if I need to do it. You know, I'll go hunting. You know, uh, open source, whatever. Like uh, I recently found like. Um, I wanted to just do these really destructed uh, 3D objects, and I found this little clay modeler where you just kind of have a ball of clay. And I was like, well, if you just really destroy it, you get all this kind of weird faceted stuff. You know, things like that. It's just like, I think sometimes you've got to break something to see what bits it had hidden. Cool. No, no problem. Any other questions? Yay! <laughs> Thanks, guys.